Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 64th episode of Retuning Your Firm. I'm Richard Chaplin, and I'm delighted to be with you with three excellent panelists. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Lee Bryant, who is the co-founder of Post Shift, which is a a very interesting organization. It's using social technology to put humans first, which I think is, is quite an interesting uh, way of thinking about it. So um, welcome, Lee. Thank you, Richard. Our second panelist is Candida Snow. And Candida is a consultant at Hofstetter Insights, and she's gonna be talking to us today on intercultural management, which is a huge topic. So I'm sure she'll find some two or three key points to share with us on what happens when people from different cultures, and that could be within the same organization or cross borders, get together and what some of the good and perhaps less good outcomes that emerge as a result. So our third panelist is Ben Page, who is the recently appointed global CEO at Ipsos. Congratulations, Ben. And uh, he was going to be talking today about leadership trends, which given he runs a massive market research firm. I suspect he can take in any direction he wants, and I'm sure he'll give us five minutes of really fascinating insights there. So those are our panel today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, we're also joined, as always, by our regular panelist, and today is Jeremy Beard. And Jeremy is the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre, and really good to have you today with us, Jeremy, and uh, looking forward to your, I called you the weather vane, in other words, sort of absolutely, let's make sure that we take these ideas and ground them in the reality of running a professional services firm, of which you have huge day-to-day -day experience. So thank you for joining us for that. Before we go on with um, the sort of uh, the poll section, I just really wanted to kind of just talk you through some of the, the forum news at the moment. And... Um, First, we just wanted to mention there's a new service that we're launching next week, and it's called Mentor Match. And it's quite interesting. What we're trying to do there is to actually bring together people who are interested in being either a mentor or a mentee, but not within the same organization, which is the typical, but across organizations. And as many people remind me, mentoring is nothing much to do with seniority. It's everything to do with experience and expertise. So actually reverse mentoring isn't maybe not reverse mentoring at all. Maybe it's just regular mentoring. It's just unusual for it to be in that direction, but why should it be? So lots of people are watching these videos, over 200 now from past shows. So please don't miss out on that. Uh, the show, um, again, as you know, is fortnightly. Thank you for not coming in last week. And we're now taking a short break and we'll be returning on the 14th of January. And we have 20 shows planned for 2022, which is sort of effectively every other week with a few gaps for summer and winter breaks. Um, the transatlantic shows, a couple of those have happened already. We're planning 10 of those looking on starting on the 19th of Jan. And then the last one I was going to mention briefly was that the Fast Track Innovation Guide and, and Associated Bespoke Sprints. We, we did a soft launch at the Strategy and Marketing Roundtable on Tuesday. And uh, firmware leaders are going to learn a little bit more about that uh, at their session next week. So what, what's that one last one all about? Well, it's got four or five areas, just quickly running through them. We're talking about from the academics, how do you work through a series of tested and proven activities around design sprints? Uh, we have some fact sheets looking at each of the spe steps of those sprints, the background, the purpose, the duration, the requirements, activities, outcomes, et cetera. We show you lots of proformers, how to use it, whether it's agendas, journeys, outputs, tasks, a, a nice walkthrough. Uh, we have a central place where you can go and download useful forms, images, tools, videos, et cetera. And we actually provide you with a suggested template so how you can actually run one of those sprints, which again, I think is quite exciting. So I'm just gonna show you briefly what the uh, roadmap looks like. And again, it's probably not very clear, but you have your, uh, innovation roadmap on the on the right, and then you have the cards that you can drag in, and everybody has their own sticky, which is quite exciting. So that's enough for that one, I think. So let's move on to today. We're now coming into an area where I'm I really not sure I dare to tread, given we have Ben on the call today, uh, on the show. But uh, we're doing feedback and poll results. I think barometers is probably what they would call them in Ben's trade because they're not anything like as um, what should we say um, <clears throat> comprehensive. But I think it's as a good zeitgeist. It means within a few days. As you can see from this quote, I can get back to government 
uh, something that they find useful. At the end of the day, the Q&D, the quick and dirty research does have a place to play in the world, I believe. So what did we do last time? Well, you may recall a couple of weeks ago, we asked you to look at ESG because of obviously Glasgow happening at that point. And we did an ESG maturity poll. And this is all available as you'll notice to link from the invite for today. And what were the key findings? Well, we, what we were being told was that over 50% of key clients, that's not obviously not every client, but the key clients are seeking information on ESG performance of their advisors. Uh, now that's not the same as you broadcasting out what you're doing. This is them speaking information from you. So genuine communication rather than broadcasting. So that again is quite interesting, I think. Um, we, we did that, we did the same survey back in September, 2020, so a little over a year before. And we saw a significant increase in the number of firms which are now planning to have a dedicated resource. Curiously, there weren't as many much change in those who actually had one, but a lot of people had now said, oh, well, we, we think you're getting one rather than we're not interested. So that was a big change. Um, firms are now much more focused on renewables and conservation of resources, but actually very few professional firms are currently measuring their carbon footprint. They're saying, oh, we're doing good, good things, but very few are actually measuring it. And as they always say in life, if it's not measured, it's very hard to persuade people to do anything differently. So uh, maybe that's the next step for a lot of people. I think... Um, uh, excuse me, Glasgow has helped from that point of view. Moving on to some of the S from EDI, uh, from ESG, the quality data, uh, diversity and inclusiveness, we're finding that 80% of the firms who completed the poll are measuring it, but actually less than half are then sharing this data with either their people or externally, which seemed again to be a little bit of a pointless exercise because at the end of the day, uh, this is something that genuinely does make a difference when you're looking to people who might want to be work for you or indeed clients who might want to instruct you, particularly if they're in financial services and probably getting increasing pressure by say fund managers to actually invest in suitable organizations. And, um, and then the other one, and again, this probably won't surprise you hugely, anybody who's ever worked and lived in a professional services firm, the optics associated with employee and partner compensation are mostly only shared with partners. Um, so um, we're not talking here about the numbers, we're talking about the optics, you know, uh, but it just isn't happening. So again, those were some points that came out. So I guess in terms of maturity, we asked the question, how mature do you think you are? And everybody saw that, oh, we're, we're quite mature, but, but I'm not so sure. So this was the first question. I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, slides uh, quickly. So 50% of the key clients, that's the red and the, um, let's get it right. Sorry, Oops. make sure I don't mislead you. Uh, yeah, the, it's the green, 46%, and then the purple, 5 8%, so a little over 50% saying, yep, we would be looking for information. Information is one thing. Would they do anything with it? That's another point. But this is information, step one of the process. Um, there are significant increases, as I mentioned, and the, I think the columns to look at are the one on the far left, which is no, and there is no plan to do so within the next year, which has dropped from 45% uh, a year ago down to 23%, although actually on the far right, we have a dedicated community, it hasn't really changed. So what's happening, I think, is that the people who will get it have still got it, which is good, uh, but the ones who didn't get it are now feeling they need to get it. That's sort of what it's telling me. Uh, in terms of carbon footprint, uh, the first two columns are people who are either not seeing it as a priority, which is about 20%, I guess. Efforts are being made, but there is no measurement of our performance. Um, that is 54%, and that plus the 15 means that over half people aren't actually doing anything much around the measurement. And uh, moving on to the EDI for a minute, um, there's 23 plus 23, that's the current ones, less than half are actually sharing. The others are all doing something, not as many changes in that area, because I think diversity has been a topic that's been with us for some time. So what are we going to be doing today? Well, today's poll is actually going to be around management team performance reviews. And you may remember uh, a, week, a couple of weeks, about a month ago now, we looked at uh, some topics around management team performance and uh, basically saw that uh, we thought there was a bit of a disconnect between the system, if you like, and the um, how it was actually being applied to management and management's contribution to projects, as opposed to more technical frontline advisors and their contribution to the particular job they're working on. So I thought I'd explore it a little bit more. And again, we had a benefit of a poll about, uh, oh, I don't know, about 18 months ago, we did this one. So let's just run through exactly what this poll is all about. So this poll is really covering the effectiveness of leaders at agreeing objectives with their team. 
and then ditto to the next level. So how effective are people at bringing objectives? Because if people don't know what they're doing, then likelihood is you'll end up in the wrong place. Uh, to what extent is performance being reviewed at the end of every management project? Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, who's primarily responsible for conducting reviews? How often both formal and informal feedback is given on performance as in a management capacity? What are the main inputs? What are the tools to manage performance reviews? and the most important aspects. And then finally, picking up the point I said earlier, what's the strength of the link of performance reviews to compensation? Um, I think that's gonna need about four minutes, uh, mostly single select, some multi, but if you need more time, as always, very happy to give it to you. So I will now start the poll. Um, first question uh, was the extent to which people are actually good at agreeing objectives. And I think it's, uh, well, Effective is kind of the, the most popular with about half of you, but there are a few very effective, but there are also some who are ineffective. And if we cascade down to the next level, pretty much the same result. So the management team are fairly happy that not just they are, as leaders are giving uh, clear objectives, but they're, they're ne they're do the next level down are doing the same to their teams. That, that's helpful. Um, how consistently is performance reviewed? at the end of every management project, 10% uh, part of how we work, 30% uh, rarely, 40% sometimes. So uh, I would say very much the jury on that one says that uh, this is not happening to the, uh, in a very consistent way. So uh, who then is primarily responsible for conducting these reviews? And again, that would be as possibly you'd expect, mainly the managing partner, although again, 30% of the people completing it today so there are no such reviews completed so uh, if I was in management role at that firm it could be challenging I think and to know how I'm doing uh, in terms of feedback uh, again most firms the biggest chunk is this is the formal feedback I think let's just check yep the formal feedback most firms are doing it every uh, annually that's 30 percent some less than annually 20 percent 10 percent never so there's a chunk 60 percent it's annual or less often uh, very hard to remember what somebody was doing a year ago, particularly in COVID world. So uh, let's just see how helpful that is. Informal feedback. Um, the 20% who say it's less than annual for informal. Uh, I don't know what world they're working in. And that seems really weird. Uh, weekly, 20%, but that's probably more like what most people would expect to have informal uh, feedback on progress or performance. But clearly that isn't happening everywhere. Uh, what are the main determinants? The man that comes out very strongly is previously set objectives and personal behavior. And of course, the challenge with previously set ob objectives is that that therefore could end up with groupthink and merely prolonging the existing objectives, which may not have been as they should have been in the first place. So other ones like multi-source feedback, sometimes known as 360, et cetera, really th th a few project-based feedback, very few job-based capabilities, very few. So. So the message really is that it's about the person and the goals they were set that determines the inputs. Um, in terms of the methods, mostly self-assessment forms, 60%. Some people using ratings, nobody's using false rankings, which I know is for good for some, but less good for others because it forces the lowest 10% out, which isn't very conducive to collaboration and partnerships, many people would argue. Uh, moderation meetings, 40%. 10% uh, no tools or methods at all. In terms of which three aspects of the performance review process for management team members do you see as being the most important, um, the ones that come through very strongly is that uh, team members frequently receiving praise, positive feedback and public recognition for their contribution, which kind of got runs contrary completely to the uh, earlier thing about people not getting informal feedback. So uh, I'm not a market research specialist, but I think even, even me can see some sort of disconnect there. Um, and then finally, to what extent are the outputs of the performance management process used to compensation, neither strong nor weak, 50%, weak 10, very weak 10. So 70% of people are saying that, yeah, there isn't really much of a linkage between the, the performance management process and the money that people get paid. Um, that seems to me, again, to be probably a missed opportunity because I think there are things that may emerge in a performance management system or process for which would indicate whether somebody should be paid more or less than some of their counterparts. But I'm not an expert. I'm really bringing these polls back to you. Thank you again as a group for having completed. So over to our first guest. And our first guest is Lee Bryant. And Lee is going to come and talk to us today about 
social technology. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Richard. Um, so good morning, everybody. Nice to, uh, nice to join you. Um, my, my sort of background and my interests are varied. I'm a technologist, um, a sort of a, a social scientist by training and education. But really what I'm interested in is how we can develop new organizational operating systems, which use the very positive affordances of digital technology and data to create better structure, culture, practice, leadership, and, um, and technology in our organization. So we've um, been working on that topic, uh, both on the technology side and the organizational design side, and more recently on the sort of leadership side uh, for, for many years, actually. And I think what's interesting today is that the COVID lockdowns have really accelerated digital transformation in one very important sense by forcing us to work remotely. But I think the debate is still far too focused on where we work. Is it the home or is it the office rather than how we work? In other words, are we working via you know, online collaboration and systems or are we still using the, the sort of stone age tools of emails and uh, meetings and conference calls? And I think this is really key to developing a successful hybrid model. It's not about how many days you're sitting in meeting rooms watching people eat biscuits. Um, it really is, you know, how we can work seamlessly between different physical uh, locations. So this raises the question for me of, you know, what and where is the fabric of our organizations when we are not in the office? Is it, you know, the buildings and the real estate and the physical meeting rooms, or is it the online networks and systems and platforms that we're using to coordinate our work? Now, over the last... Um, well, two years, I suppose. I've spent a great deal of time as academic director of some uh, some large leadership development programs and also teaching on some of those programs as well during the pandemic. And I think one of the things I've found is that almost all executives that I'm talking to are pinned to the wall of their schedule by back-to-back -back Teams calls or Zoom calls. And then in the evening, they tackle the hundreds of corporate spam emails um, which hit them like a, like a blizzard. And, you know, needless to say, this is a very, very poor way of working. It's incredibly unproductive and it keeps them um, in a position which means they're unable to change the system. And I think that's the, the real challenge that many of these people um, face. I, I personally find professional services very interesting and I've worked in it um, over the years in many different areas because professional services firms are often pure knowledge organizations. Um, but the problem is, as long as the revenue pipe is flowing, uh, many of them still don't really have an incentive to truly digitize or develop scalable efficiencies. So they sort of continue in this mode whilst platform based disruptors are nibbling away um, at important parts of their, their market. So if you look at accounting or insurance or you know, finance, they're literally made of algorithms, but these algorithms are sort of trapped in Excel files or old enterprise systems, or maybe a PMS or something like that. And if you look at legal, advisory, consulting firms, these are, you know, largely constructed from a series of sort of repeatable uh, processes, at least from a sort of 80-20 point of view, and yet their billing model disincentivizes automation and systematization. So they suffer much the same, uh, the same problem. Now, for me, I think the direction of travel, um, and I think also the starting point for, for disruptors and startups, is highly automated, connected, and service-oriented backends in these uh, companies, which embody core competencies, core services, you know, repeatable uh, processes are orchestrated on a common sort of platform but which enabled a much more free and agile front end operation where people and teams you know dealing with customers can sort of take these service building blocks and construct quite bespoke matters projects you know customer experiences and customer journeys um, using them so it's a it's a vision I, I think for the organization which is both more machine like at the back end and more automated, but at the same time, more human at the front end compared to the, you know, what I call the sort of the old model of what's to be a bureaucratic process machine, which is constructed from, you know, often sort of non premium uh, management meat, if you like. Um, so it's an interesting shift, I think, that we're part of. And I think when you realize that all connected products, connected services, connected experiences really demand a connected company, 
then you can see the, the importance of switching from, you know, sort of vertically divided silos and practice areas to something which is very much laterally uh, connected um, across the firm. Now, I think at the moment, most talented people in firms on the digital side, they know this, but they're sitting below what's effectively, you know, a very sort of marshmallowy socio-political system of middle-aged managers or partners who really, you know, don't want to um, do the hard work of um, executing that change because it impacts on them and their role, uh, you know, primarily. So I think if we want to see the kind of combinatorial innovation across practice areas that clients need, if we want to see AI or machine learning or automation or even just basic analytics in areas such as audit, for example, then we really need to overcome the silos and we need to connect our firms um, in a better way, you know, from the from the ground up. And I think where this reaches a really fine point, actually, is around employee experience, because certainly in the United States, there's this sort of great resignation. And I think it was also, you know, in play before the pandemic, to be honest. The employee experience of working in a poorly digitized firm is not an attractive proposition for the brightest and the best young people. So, you know, managing through the Stone Age tools of Word, PowerPoint and Outlook, uh, or even a, you know, a, a sort of a basic PMS, doing nonstop conference calls and being asked to work in an incredibly bureaucratic but demanding way for years on end before you can sort of, uh, you know, reach the pinnacle of, you know, sort of associate and then, and then partnership is just not really an attractive offer at the moment to, uh, to the brightest and the best young people. Plus, I think, in a sense, um, the conveyor belt's a bit stuck. We've got too many generic associate or VP level people uh, who are too grounded in the old ways of working. So there's a lot less opportunity, actually, for the talented uh, younger people who are perhaps a bit more digitally savvy to get to the top quickly enough to make it all, it all, all worthwhile. So I think for me, basically, the big generational challenge for leaders and managers today is to you know, think like architects of the digital organization, help it emerge from within the sort of calcified shell of the old uh, bureaucracy um, that we've sort of taken for granted and really lay the groundwork for you know better ways of working and I think most organizations want to do this but it, it's a bit like the old um, sort of Indian or Arabic story about the blind men and the elephant you know the whole picture is eminently knowable but most people in functions only see you know the trunk or a tusk or a leg because they're, they're living within silos and very divided uh, swim lanes and, and specialization. So I think we need also better ways of doing change and better ways of doing continuous improvement, which are not so dependent on the existing management incentives. Because, you know, if you ask, if you want to ask the, the owners of comfortable CXO uh, budgets to, you know, decentralize the existing system, it's a it's a little bit like selling meteors to a dinosaur, you know, it doesn't doesn't go well for, for, for either party. So I think for me, you know, the, the change is coming, the, the lockdowns have certainly accelerated that or, or brought it to, to the fore. And I think those of us who, you know, influence um, others and are productive based on the content we create and the outputs we create in the in the workplace and how we connect them, we will ultimately, um, you know, sort of overtake those who rely only on positional authority or giving good meeting or being physically influential in a meeting room, wearing a nice tie and, and so on. But until the core fabric of the organization really becomes the sort of online systems that connect us, then I think the, the persuasive, politically savvy partner with you know, little knowledge of the digital world will continue to hold us back. And I think that's something, maybe you know, Ben will touch on this, but I think this is something we're seeing in all areas of leadership not just in business, you know, people who can sort of simulate intelligence and, and tell funny stories. At the moment, for some reason, I can't understand, uh, people are valuing them over real domain experts and people that know what they're doing. So I think the institutional challenge of running 21st century institutions um, using the affordances of digital is ultimately a lot wider um, than just business and certainly just than professional services. But yeah, it's a really interesting uh, challenge. And, and I, as I say, a once in a generation shift. So, so that's what I sort of uh, spend my time doing. And that's what I'm really interested to sort of read about and, uh, and study about and research. So yeah, that's what I wanted to sort of share with you this morning. Thanks very much, Lee. There was, gosh, so much stuff in there. I, I'm trying to unpick it all. I have to watch the video three times, I think, once it comes out. But uh, 
I'm not sure we've got too many dinosaurs. The, the career paths is another dimension, I think, which again, we might pick up a little bit later because you know, if, does everybody have to go through the same mill to get to the leadership? That's always an interesting topic. So our second <coughs> panelist for today is Candida Snow. And Candida is an expert in the area of intercultural management and in, uh, if you like, how people from different cultures actually work together or fail to do so. And um, very much looking forward to your five minutes, Candida, over to you. Good morning, hello. What I was thinking about how to fill these five minutes and what not to put in. And I decided to talk about the, the, the value of embedding CQ, not EQ or IQ, but CQ, cultural intelligence or cultural competence in your organization, not just as a nice to have or another box that you can tick off on your DNI list, but actually as something that makes business sense, that can add value to your organization. Why? Why bother? Well, especially as Lee said, in, in professional services, so much of your business is about human interaction, is about creating relationships with each other as colleagues, but also with your clients. And that's where culture plays a huge role. Now, of course, not everything is culture. Sometimes the dynamic going on between you and your team or you and your, your client is somebody having a bad day or not liking you. But very often there's a cultural dynamic in international business that is heightened at moments of stress, pressure, conflict, and is also heightened in this virtual environment that all of us are working in now and will continue to work in for a long time. Just as an example, um, there was a lovely um, uh, case last year, just after the first lockdown of a Japanese company that put in a request to Zoom, asking them if they would please introduce a new functionality whereby they could order all the photos, all the video, all the thumbnails on the screen and give some people bigger thumbnails than others in order to be able to re recreate the physical office environment. Now, why, why did that matter? Well, from a Japanese perspective, so that people knew how to interact with each other. Who's who, who's more senior, who's more junior? When can I speak? Who's going to ask questions when? To be able to predict the environment. Now, that's just one example, but where does culture and how does culture play a role in the organization at a whole, as individual level, team level, and at leadership level? Well, it starts, for example, with recruitment, yeah, our recruitment processes and how we judge each other's behavior during recruitment. Also recruitment criteria. What does a competent professional look like? What does being, um, uh, having drive, being ambitious, being a team player look like in terms of behavior? Drop the concept of um, ambition or drive into five different cultural contexts and you're likely to find five different translations of how we interpret it. I was working recently with a, an Indian man, highly educated, PhD in his 20s, very keen, very ambitious. And he had applied for his dream role with an American company and he hadn't got it. And we encouraged him to get some feedback as to why he hadn't made it. And the feedback that he got was, we didn't think you were very interested. And he was shocked and horrified. And when we had a look at why, part of the feedback that he had got was, well, you didn't ask us any questions. You only answered our questions. And the, the, the Indian candidates sort of went, well, of course, I'm the candidate. I was there for interview. Why would I ask questions during an interview? And that had been interpreted as lack of interest, lack of commitment to the role. Um, so it also runs through culture, things like your organizational values. I looked up the organizational values of a couple of my uh, professional services clients. And then you see things like, we treat people with respect. We have integrity, we collaborate, we care. Again, all these terms have a cultural sensitivity which doesn't matter 
there is no one size fits all in culture. There's no culturally neutral way of doing things. But it does make sense to be aware and to understand how these terms roll out, what they mean to the different cultural groups that you have in your organization or your client groups as well. It runs into things with what are your subconscious assumptions of a good colleague? What makes you a good colleague? What makes you a good leader? Yeah. Um, uh, what makes you a good client? Yeah. Client relations, very culturally sensitive. I'm based in the Netherlands. A Dutch client of mine was horrified when their own Malaysian client moved into their headquarters for the duration of the project that they had been uh, that they had been assigned. Um, they sent over a group of five people and were there for nine months for the duration of the product project, which the Dutch took as being a sign of distrust, or they they they're monitoring us, they're micromanaging. But from a Malaysian perspective, was just the Malaysians being a good client, being on hand to give information, to answer questions, and to monitor, and to find out how things were doing. So both parties were just trying to fulfill their role as competent professionals, but from this very different cultural, um, cultural uh, perspective. Um, there's been a lot of research on multicultural teams and what is the added value of working in a multicultural uh, team. Nancy Adler of McGill University has done some very good research on this. And it shows that multicultural teams can go one of two ways. They can either outperform or underperform monocultural teams. And two of the determining factors are the leadership in teams, in organizations where leaders, A, acknowledge and recognize that culture plays a role in the organizational dynamic, and B, see that as being a good thing, something that can be leveraged, can add value to the organization. These are the organizations, the teams that do take advantage of the, um, of the uh, intercultural component. And of course, the opposite is true. Leaders who either don't see or don't recognize culture as playing a role, or they see it as a problem to be got around, those are the teams and the organizations for whom it does tend to become more of an obstacle than of added value. I shall never forget working with a big law firm in London with a group of lawyers who were on a big, um, uh, working on a big client account with their French counterparts. And in frustration, one of, the, one of the English lawyers said to me, why can't you just tell the French to do things properly? And I said, but the French are doing things properly, but it's a different properly. It's a different normal, yeah? Um, why bother? Why bother to know about this, to embed it in your organization? Mobility, employee, employee retention, succession planning, leadership development in our increasingly international business context really require cultural competence, awareness and sensitivity in order to be able to function um, effectively, comfortably, appropriately. Um, and finally, your organizational culture is also worth looking at. Um, is it conducive to, um, to allowing people from all different cultural backgrounds to, feel, to function effectively and to be heard and to be recognized. What sort of person makes it in your organization? What sort of characteristics, behavioral traits tend to be promoted within your organization? It may well be that your criteria, your processes, your systems are disregarding many other approaches from people from different cultural backgrounds that are equally as valuable. So it's in our, in our behavior, in our processes, and also in our mindset as a whole. I'm going to stop because Richard is, is waving at me, um, but that's just some of the points that I wanted to touch on this morning. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, Candice, and that was no great, problem. lovely insight. Cultural, cultural differences are so fundamental, and I, my wife is from South America, so for 50 years I've learned that the word you never use are right and wrong, just different and learn to love the differences. And that's my personal take.
Uh, now we turn to our third panel member and very distinguished panel member too, Ben Page. Many of you will be familiar with him on the appearing on the TV, uh, particularly around election night, although I think the political polls are a huge part of their core business, but very important reputationally. So Ben, over to you and congratulations again on your recent promotion. Thank you. So um, yes, for, for people who don't know Ipsos, we're in 90 countries. Um, I was in charge of Ipsos Mori in the UK and uh, for, a number, for, a, for a strange quirk of fate, I've ended up as global chief executive of 18,000 people in 90 countries. And I was just reflecting and really interesting listening to the previous speakers. I mean, my watchword is that uh, is the quote by Peter Drucker, which all of you will be familiar with, that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast and then it has structure for lunch. Uh, I think it's, it may, may not even be by Peter Drucker, but it's a great quote. And so uh, I think the, you know, the data on this is so unequivocal. And in my own career, I've, I've stayed in the same company for 34 years. So um, I'm, I'm relatively unusual having started as a trainee and ended up as global CEO. But I think what's so clear, and I, I, you know, I'm a person who relies on data. So very briefly, if you look at knowledge workers, which is what, and professional, uh, professional organizations, which is what we're talking about here, we obviously are living through a really interesting moment with the uh, the end of the taboo against remote working. It, it's very different in different countries. I'm sitting in Paris where um, there is a culture of actually trying to check who is in the office because uh, some of the French management here don't believe that uh, people work except when they're present at a desk, which is quite an interesting uh, idea if you're British or American. Um, so handling that across our, our network is, is interesting. And I think this point about cultural confidence, competence is, is hugely important. And it, the more diverse the organization, in some ways, the more challenging it is. And just had an interesting episode with a, an, Indian, an Indian team where they're feeling their dignity is affronted because people are asking questions about quality or, or money. But overall, if you look at um, you know, what the data shows us about leadership across cultures, actually human beings in, in most countries have more in common than they have that divides them. And as we're probably got a lot of people listening in the UK, I think the data, the data is very clear. And if you look at the performance of organizations, uh, and we've done this in a number of sectors, the data shows very clearly that there is actually very little correlation between how happy you are with your pay or the average employee's happiness with their pay and the performance of the organization. There's very little correlation with whether or not your boss is nice and the performance and the overall performance of the organization. There's very little uh, correlation, interestingly, on the amount of perceived bureaucracy in an organization and actually what its, uh, its, its overall performance looks like. So I, I found that really interesting because everybody, we all, we all want more pay all the time, but um, actually a, a lot of, in many large organizations, we concentrate all the, all the flexible pay on the people at the top and many of whom, most of whom are never going to leave. And that's something I'm certainly gonna be working on in my tenure as global chief executive. And we don't, we don't actually reward perhaps some of the people further down the chain with enough flexible remuneration. But anyway, what the data does show, however, uh, very, very clearly, is that the correlates with high performing uh, organizations are perhaps unsurprisingly around communications. Uh, so people, it's about five times higher in the top performers, the proportion of people who feel they're being kept well informed than in the worst performers. Uh, a very strong correlation with a sense of autonomy and control um, and, you know, the data on this, again, we've known this for over a century. There's a, there was a very early study of life expectancy in Her Majesty's Treasury around the turn of the century, at the beginning of the 20th century. And what it showed is that the, uh, the, the, the permanent secretary and the senior people at the top tended on average, and they're all working in the same building, to live about 10 years longer than the people at the bottom of the organisation. And so they're all, in, in 1900 or so, they were mostly men. But the people, the men at the top who were in control were living much longer than the clerks and people who obviously whose lives didn't have control. And I think a challenge in professional services is how we get the work done while giving people that sort of sense of autonomy. We know we don't make plants grow faster by pulling them out by the roots and having a look every five minutes. 
but I do have some managers who have tendencies in that direction, which will have to be stopped. Um, uh, and then, you know, another, another key correlate with high performance is freedom to innovate. But obviously I can't have, uh, you know, in 90 countries, 90 countries of their own IT strategy, 90 countries of their own protocols, 90 countries trying out new software all the time in different 90 different types of software. So again, one needs to one needs to control it, but people have to feel that they can do new things. Um, so those are some key things. And then finally, because I think we are, I'll be short, is the the one of the other overarching things that comes out of this is that clarity about the overall goals of the organisation. People want to feel part of something that's bigger than themselves. And so when you look at an organization like Tesco at the height of its powers in the past, where it was taking, I think, 9% of all retail spending in the United Kingdom, that motto of every little helps ran like a golden thread through the organization because people were appraised on what have you done today to make things better for the company, for, for the for, for customers, whether they were stacking shelves, driving a lorry, running a store, buying fruit, you name it, that sort of absolute clarity. And what we see when we compare organizations is that the, the top performers, again, are about 40% more likely to have everybody in the organization clear about the overall goals, not the goals of their team or their department. And there's only a very weak, you know, you can, have a you can be running a terrible hospital where you're 10 times more likely to kill people than a brilliant hospital. And everybody in the oncology department or everybody in orthopedics will say that we know what we're doing in orthopedics. But when you look at the best hospitals, the one that you and I would want to be treated in, uh, you will find that the top ones have a, have a bigger goal about everybody from the porter who's taking the bodies to the mortuary to the, to the brain surgeon has a sort of shared understanding. You see it in commercial organizations, whether they're supermarkets, manufacturing companies. You know, if you look at Google or Apple, there will be clarity about what they're trying to do. So, and spending time on that, and it's something I've learned in my own career, is really, really important. People want to feel part of something that's bigger than themselves, but also bigger than their small immediate team. And if you get that stuff right, um, you'll do well. I will shut up. Wish me luck. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, you've set yourself a promising agenda, I think. I certainly won't be kept unbusy. Um, Jeremy, join us now. Uh, welcome. And uh, a few thoughts, and then we've got about we've got about 10 minutes left, and then we'll have a, a quick panel session. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, all the speakers, all excellent, very, very thought-provoking. Um, some points were re resonated, others, other points, uh, I'll probably say this before, make me shiver. Um, uh, reference to middle-aged partners by Lee was, uh, I don't know whether you saw me smirk at that point, but that was quite, uh, quite entertaining. Um, yes, just to pick up on a few points that have been, that have been mentioned this morning, I suppose just looking at Lee's reference to the, the fabric of the organisation, and I suppose the challenge for professional service firms at the moment, and certainly we feel this is that that mix between being back in the office and still working from home and, and, and getting that right. And certainly um, our whole culture historically has been built on interaction of team players, and that has largely been physical interaction. Um, as the firm, we are back in the office a reasonable amount of time, but certainly the message I am getting from our managers and my colleagues, my partners, is that probably we would like to see um, the more junior members of staff physically in the office, physically at client sites more than we have been so whilst we're working in this hybrid world and there is lots of benefit of that and i'm sure that is going to continue um, there is a desire to to probably have a little bit more physical presence certainly for the more junior members of staff and primarily from a a learning and development point of view um a couple of comments leadership for the theme of, of of the day i guess and we have a partner seminar in two weeks time and certainly uh, that is a key focus of our seminar. And I think as we become more of a hybrid firm and as we become bigger and we have more teams within the organization, then leadership becomes more important. And whether that's leadership from the management team, the management board, 
um, right through the organization to, to, to leading an audit team, almost, you can say. Um, so that whole um, concept of leadership and, and leadership training, we're, we're just looking at our, our new strategy for the next three years and, and working with our people more on those softer skills as opposed to their technical ability it, it, it is very important and a, and a key part of that strategy. So developing people more as leaders, thinking more about their careers, thinking more about what the different generations want from their career and listening to them and, and taking on, on that on board is, is, is very important. Um, I was very taken by, uh, as well, Lee's comment on... Um, a poorly digitized firm not being attractive to employees. And again, certainly another aspect of our strategy is to, is to improve our innovation and, and technology side um, and recognizing, and, and again, a, a comment Lee made was about the, the revenue pipe flowing. You know, you can get caught in that trap and you, you and I recognize that. And, and, and again, we've probably under, under invested and, and not paid the level of attention to innovation that we should have done. But I think, as Lee said, there are disruptors in the marketplace at the moment that are really going to challenge us if we don't start to get to grips with that a lot better. So, so that is certainly something that, um, that, that, is, that is very important to us. Um, just on, on Ben's comment uh, about the overall objectives of the organisation, we have, a, as I say, we're just finalising our strategy. As you probably not be surprised, but some will be horrified, the, the strategy document at partner level runs to about 50 pages, but we are in the process of producing a six page summary or there or thereabouts summary of that that will be very clear and concise. We've gone to an external consultant to help us to, 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 to wordsmith that. And, you, you know, that will be, we will present that to, to all the people in our organisation so that hopefully everyone has, has a clear view as to what, as an organisation, our overall strategic aims are. There were some comments on behaviours during recruitment. Um, and I think that's particularly challenging in the in the current market. And we shouldn't forget that it's certainly an employee's market at the moment. And we as the interviewers are are, are being interviewed as much as the employees are really. Um, and when we are online, it is easy to get into bad habits of looking at phones and, and that sort of thing. And and. Certainly, I think we need to be very conscious of, in the current climate, recognising that we are we are selling ourselves rather than buying, and therefore, appropriate research beforehand, attention during the the interview process when you're not face to face, perhaps, is is really important. Um, again, uh, I, I think those were probably the things, Richard. That I was going to pick up on. Thanks very much. And uh, we're sort of kind of unfortunately have uh, not a whole amount of time left. And, and Ben has had to rush off to another meeting. But uh, Lee, just a sort of quick thing there. We were talking a little bit about uh, the importance of career paths. And to what extent do you think uh, it helps if uh, different career paths are shaped within the organization for those who are not necessarily on the front line delivering client services? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, first of all, uh, fewer and fewer young people want to make the trade-offs necessary to reach partner by the traditional means. I think that's just, that's what I'm certainly seeing from talking to younger people. They want more of a balanced life. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, in a way, sometimes that that social pyramid turns you into a sort of almost like, a, you know, a generic sort of uh, you know, manager to get there, whereas maybe they want to retain a specialization in some obviously areas of law, but also in technology or customer journey design or whatever it might be. So I think we need more hybrids. Um, and I think the, the easiest and quickest solution is just to find all of our digitally advanced people and massively over promote them immediately and not bury them beneath generic managers. You know, I've done projects with some very talented technologists in a big accounting firm. And I'm, you know, I have to go through three layers of people that know nothing about the topic before I can even speak to them sometimes. And that's just silly. 
So I think um, a, a rapid overpromotion of, of not, it's not about youth, just about digital um, skills and awareness and knowledge of the digital world, that will help. And I think that will shake things up a little bit. So there would be my quick tips. Thank you. And, and turning to Canada for a minute, we're talking there a minute ago about technological skills and you're talking about cultural awareness skills. Do you see any overlap between the two? Oh, um, absolutely. In as far as, um, uh, like I said, we feel very often when we're when we're working with each other across cultures using all these different technologies as if it's a great leveler. And it is absolutely true what Ben said. We will always have more in common than we will ever have differences. Um, but those signals the, and the interpretation of the signals that we can do more easily face to face, of course, in our own culture, let alone across cultures, um, we, we, we can't even pick them up using these technologies, um, uh, whether we're on Zoom or, or whatever, email, et cetera, any of the digital technologies tend to uh, cover up the cultural differences that play even greater a role in our communication patterns, in our how we interpret each other's behavior. So it's exacerbated, if you like, uh, cultural differences tend to be augmented or exacerbated in the virtual environment by these technology platforms, which are not culturally neutral either. I don't well, know if Lee, you would agree with that. Thank you. I'm sorry to say that we are, our time is up. Um, it's 10 o'clock. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, our panel today. I'd like to thank Lee for sharing his thoughts on social technology, coming to us from Portugal, as it happens. Uh, Candida from the Netherlands talking about the intercultural. Uh, ben giving us his very great insights. Unfortunately, like most CEOs, off to the next meeting already. And uh, Jeremy, thank you for giving us your, your take on the things that resonated with you. And hopefully we haven't made you too panicked today with some of the issues that were being raised. So thank you again. Uh,